It's Monday night, and it's a brand new episode of Graphic Policy Radio, the show that mixes comics and politics. We're back to our regular time, and we've got a brand new guest joining us. Uh, before we kick off, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our thoughts go out to those in Manchester with the, the horrific news that it's uh, hitting the news uh, that you know there was an attack or something happened at a concert. Um, folks have lost their lives, many injured. Um, and of course, our, our thoughts go to them. And then I also want to say our thoughts go out to uh, the Snyder family, uh, director of uh, Justice League and a lot of uh, DC's films uh, who revealed the tragedy that happened in their family. And, um, you know, our thoughts and our minds and all go out to them of a, a very tragic moment. Um, yeah, hate hate to always start on a, a downer, but. Need it, kind of needed to. Uh, but I also want to thank yeah. everyone who joined us for last week's episode. It was our 200th episode, and we had to end quickly, so I didn't get to say uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening in to all 200 episodes. And we'll, you know, here's to 200 more. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be doing this because there really wasn't be much point to it. So thank you from the, the bottom of my heart, and I, I really appreciate it. And especially thank you to my co-host, Alana. How you doing? Hi. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm excited because this Wednesday we're doing another politics tweet chat, which is an opportunity for fans and activists to get together and have a conversation on Twitter about, in this case, one particular show that many of us know and love, which is Steven Universe. Um, Definitely a show that has a huge social media following and so many of the conversations that folks have about it deal with issues like gender presentation, queer family, immigration like this show is just full of issues that are really talked about in a really uh, nurturing and creative way that just doesn't happen in shows for people of any age let alone for children and um, so we want to have some of those conversations especially in the light of a couple of really awesome organizers who are doing work um, in feminist and LGBTQ communities and so if you are watching the show and you should be on Twitter and tweet with us at 9 o'clock Eastern on Wednesday. Um, we've got guests like Charles Pulliam Moore from io9, and uh, it's going to be really awesome. So I hope folks will get ready to join us for that. And uh, that's about it for me. Yeah, the other one, last one was really successful, so it should be really cool to see. Uh, so tonight, we've got a really cool guest, uh, something that you saw, I don't, I don't think we've ever had anyone in uh, this position before. Uh, if you've ever wondered what a comic car- color list does, you're going to find out tonight. Um, it's uh, really, really cool, and, and we're going to dive into a position that you definitely don't hear enough talking about, um, including ourselves. I'm trying to get much better at it. Uh, our guest tonight is someone who uh, just does so much in the industry, one of the hardest working people, Tamara Bonvillain a professional colorist applying color and shading to comics. She's worked in the comics industry since 2012 and is currently working on some awesome series, Doom Patrol, Moon Girl, Devil Dinosaur, Wayward, Uncanny Avengers, uh, and a whole bunch more. So we're going to go find out about this aspect of comics and uh, learn a hell of a lot, hopefully. So, Tamara, welcome to the show. Hello. I wanted to thank you for joining us. Um, I uh, I think I first became aware of your work when you were working on Nighthawk, which was a Marvel comic mm-hmm. that the show was big champions of. And I think I started following you on Twitter there, in part because uh, Ramon Villalobos was like, definitely be sure to shout out Tamara. And I said, <laughs> oh, you're colorist. Oh, yes, she's really good. Um, I remember particularly looking at that one scene, and I think it was the first issue of the comic, where Nighthawk is taking a shower, and then there's such saturated magenta colors, and um, mm-hmm. that's what really put you on our radar. And I think it's it's past due time for us to really sit and talk with colorists and what they do and what they bring to comics. So thank you for joining us. Oh yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. So I know you're someone who studied uh, you studied comics at, in um, like in a comics program. Um, but how did you come into being a colorist? Like, what made you choose that particular path within the comic industry? Um, yeah, I went to the Kubert School, so you just get kind of like a general comics and illustration kind of uh, education there. And, you know, most of the people there want to get into comics or, or some kind of similar field. 
Um, and just afterwards, I was just looking for any kind of work. I, I was lucky enough to get a kind of a day job that was at least art related. So I wasn't like too much pressure, like right out of school. Um, but like a lot of the stuff I'd pick up is other students um, or other people I'd known or connections to the school would ask me to color something for them, you know? And just kind of over time doing that, you get connections to people they diverge and go on different projects and they recommend you to people and so on and so on. Like I was still looking for like all sorts of different kind of work for a while, but after a time I just started picking up so much coloring work that it was just easier to keep doing that. Like I didn't have to like look as hard because after a while I had kind of a reputation and was building up contacts through that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so it was almost like other people realized you were really great at it. Well, I did kind of like start to focus a little bit more on it towards the end. Um, I have an interest in other areas too, but it just, I felt like maybe I was stronger there. So I, I would kind of like start gearing like uh, towards doing coloring and trying to find work specifically for that. Um, and yeah, it just, like I said, it just over time, it kind of started to work out. So. And what brought you into comics sort of in the first place? Uh, interest and then professional interest. I don't know. I mean, I just liked comics since I was a kid. I lived, like a lot of cartoons and stuff based on comics around that time, like 90s era kind of. So that got me like interested in it and from that way more. And I just liked to draw since I was a kid. So that was just kind of a natural progression to, to go for that. Cool. Yeah. It's, um, I'm always interested in seeing people's career paths from specifically like studying, you know, at Cuber School, et cetera. We've had a, definitely mm-hmm. had a few grads on the show. Yeah. What do you do, like, as a colorist? Like, what is the process? Like, how does it begin? Particularly if you're starting on, like, a new title where there hasn't really been a, a color look established. I'd sort of love to hear how you begin on that process. Uh, sure. Um, I'm trying to think of how to how – to to phrase that um well like first and foremost pretty much all color is at least after a certain point maybe in the beginning you're doing your own flats and flats are just basically you send it to someone and they just fill in all the the flat colors you know like basically to help you like color within the lines without having to like constantly go back and forth and it just saves you that time of delineating everything um so that's more of like a uh, just like a technical thing not the really a creative side of it because you're going to change all those colors um, but yeah, after that, then it just depends on what it is, I guess, you know, like, um, I don't, I don't really do anything very specifically, uh, honestly, but I just kind of like, kind of intuit it, I guess, like based on what it is, if there's any kind of notes already, you know, like to work within those limitations, uh, and that gives you like some parameters to start with. Um, but yeah, I usually just kind of like feel it out, um, just trying to figure out a palette for the, for like each different scene, you know, and hopefully something that's like different. So you can, um, you know, it's like immediately recognized from this scene versus that scene. And um, just try to come up with like interesting character designs if that's part of it. Um, if, if someone else hasn't already come up with the, the color scheme for their designs. I actually hadn't heard of the position of a flatter until about a year ago. Yeah. Basically, the folks who sort of draw the outlines for, and this is like a digital, this is just, this is just something that happens within the advent of digital coloring, right? Yes. Or, yeah. And yeah. then you can kind of like use the fancy lasso tools and stuff to like <laughs> separate out. Yeah, there's, there's different tools you can use. Um, use the magic wand a little bit. You might have to get a little creative with it though, because a lot of magic wand kind of like selects things that are all contiguous. Like they're all mm-hmm. like in a, oh, I, like, yeah. imagine like <laughs> lines, like drawing like a circle around something. So it was like everything in the circle or out of the circle. It, but, you know, some artists draw with more like broken lines. So then you have to, you have to do things to like make that work or use a pencil tool or la- different lassos. Um, um, with the anti-aliasing turned off, which is very key. Uh, it's the, with the differences there, it's like, if there's like a hard edge between one color and the next, or there's like a kind of like a blend, you don't want that because then you can't select it very easily. Uh, you'll mm-hmm. have like a line basically between those two colors that's like not selected and it just makes a mess. Um, but yeah, that's, 
usually helpful. It saves so much time. Like I used to flat for a long time before I started coloring myself professionally and I was very slow. <laughs> so I was like, I wouldn't be able to do nearly as much as I do now if, uh, if there weren't flatters. Have and you the flatters, only, sorry. go ahead and finish your question. I'll ask you after. And the flatters, like they really have a lot of discretion as well in terms of like, what, what is the dividing line that goes between like one color and another, or like where does the gradient begin? Is that kind of coming from them as well, or is that strictly coming from? Well, there's some artists that it's very clear, you know, there's everything's very straightforward and delineated, and there's other things where like, especially when you get to like special effects, like explosions or something where it's like maybe not as clear, should this be separated, should this not be? Um, but I mean, that's really the only decision. I'll, I will have to like often edit flats that are just kind of not exactly what I was looking for, you know, like um, for those things or, or when I'm finished, I'll have to go back and kind of patch some stuff that, that wasn't exactly how I would see it being separated. Um, that doesn't have too much effect on the final thing other than do you have to edit it or not, you know, for your own purposes. Mm. Uh, have you only ever worked in digital? I mean, have you, it, because the the question I want to know is like, is there a difference in what you do of of digital versus non digital? Because um, I got to imagine today it's a hell of a lot easier than it was like twenty years ago. Now that that you were doing it twenty years ago. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean I've done <laughs> I've I've done you know different medium, uh, so I have worked traditionally, not professionally, but um, at the school uh, they were still using like these um, they're called Dr. Martin dyes, which are basically like super concentrated watercolors and I enjoyed using them but it would just be really impractical to use it for for comics because you'd have to find a way to print out the comic um, on a type of paper that you could that can take you know wet medium then you have to scan it again you have to send it in and then if there's any kind of notes <laughs> you just like you basically would have to start over uh, depending on how mm -hmm. extensive they were you know, it's like, oh, that that character should have been green instead of red or something like that. I was like, oh, well, I can't really fix that. Like with that medium, you know, um, digitally, it's just, you know, it's much easier to make those kind of changes. It's funny because for me, like as a non, as someone who learned how to do art, with, you know, old school pen and paper, um, and you know, we had computers for like terrible MS Paint, and like I don't remember the name of the programs we used to have back in like the year 1990. I found it to be so remarkably fine motor skill intensive and challenging to do anything on the computer. And I'm still just like, I, I, I still am just awed that people are able to like lasso things with such precision. Let alone, <laughs> well, I think um, a lot of it too know, is that uh, most of us use either just like a tablet that you know, like kind of use that lays down and then it's uh, so you just have like a, like where you have your keyboard and it registers on the mm -hmm. screen or like now I have a Cintiq where I draw directly on the screen. So it's a lot more like, you know, feels like you're applying it directly, you know, and it's less like a disconnect, mm -hmm. especially trying to use a mouse, which is a nightmare. Oh God. Yeah. The nightmare of our computer childhoods. <laughs> did you try to, did you, did you experiment with computer art at all when you were a kid too? Oh yeah. I had like Photoshop and other weird, well, I had weird programs first. I don't even remember what they were. They're just nothing programs at the time, <laughs> but eventually like found uh, Photoshop and started like playing with it in high, at the end of high school and like early college and stuff like that in the nineties. Yeah. I, that was so unfathomable to me, but I definitely yeah. can imagine how much this field is like just you guys can can have so much more flexibility, like that you have the editability moving forward. I mean, do you, you know, a lot of artists work digitally, you know, pencil or pencil, sorry, I'm saying work digitally to start with, but um, are you, do you primarily work with artists who have done their initial work digitally or are they scanning and things that they've drawn generally for you and the inker? Uh, it's, a, it's a mix really. Um, I have some people that work 100% traditionally, other people that work 100% digitally, and then other people that kind of, you know, mix and match. Like a lot of people now will do like layouts or pencils even, like a version of pencils on the computer and then print it out at size and ink from that. Um, just so it's like easier at that stage to 
make changes and move things around and like just quickly do it. Um, but yeah, it's all over the place. People are doing uh, using lots of different methods. Is there one that you particularly like more than others? It doesn't. It doesn't really matter for me. Um, the only thing that, that that kind of is, or the only time that's kind of a factor, is the thing that digital will allow you to do is separate things. So a lot of times they'll do like color holds or effects, right? And you, so there's like, say like rain is the obvious one, and there's rain and there's lines all over everything, <laughs> but it intersects a lot of things. And then if you want to color hold that or do some kind of effect with that, it's hard to like isolate just that and just work with that. So you have to do this very tedious process of doing that. But if someone's working digitally, they can draw everything and they can draw the rain on a different layer and they can give that to you and then you can use that like on its own and like other variations of that. But yeah, so it's not, it's not really that big a deal and it depends on the type of art anyway. Um, but that's really the only benefit. So I guess a small edge to digital. Hmm. I, I didn't remember like even when like learning how to do like zip tone transfers and stuff like that for like backgrounds and textures mm -hmm. in like my cartooning class in high school. <laughs> I, I, it's funny because I think that there was this period of time in like the early days of digital color where just everything was heinous. <laughs> and I have such a bias against it because I was looking at it like all of this is sloppy. The separations look wrong. Why can't they just do it old school? Old school was limiting, but at least it looks good. Like the artists knew how to work around it. But now you guys actually, you know, like the, the artists become refined, people with more experience, folks really know how to use it. Um, but there was such a, there was a rough, I want to say decade probably, you know, yeah, I, of like digital coloring. I think just like there was like a lot of limits to the technology and probably people's familiarity with it that mm -hmm. was a big hindrance. I think sometimes, not always, obviously there were good colors before now, but that some mm -hmm. people, they didn't take it at, they didn't treat it as seriously. Like they didn't consider it as important a role. So maybe some of the people doing it weren't as like experienced or, you know, uh, and when you're doing like flat color, old school way versus, you know, giving someone a computer and all these like gradients and effects and stuff all of a sudden and they just go a little wild with them. Um, but yeah. I just it's felt like so a, many of the early yeah, gradient yeah. stuff, they looked so cheesy and I would just like, I want you just, just make it even little, those little bend high cuts, like anything, make <laughs> it flat, it would be okay. And it's I just feel like that the field has just gone so much better. Like now, you know, yeah. I mean, people are really fantastic these, these days. Yeah, I think I think it was like I said, like that was like part of a limitation, and then people just got carried away. The gradients were probably like the easiest thing to do. Couldn't really do a lot of. You could, but it would be time consuming and file size and stuff at the time. Like you know, spaces opened up dramatically uh, in like hard drive space and stuff like that mm. over time. It's true. Oh gosh, do we need to explain what a gradient is? I don't really have a sense. I realize I'm not. I don't have a sense of like what people know. Like I, I you know, I didn't go to Huber school. I only have like extracurricular activity level of knowledge of these things. But like, sure. Brett, you don't do art. Like, do you, like do people know what no. this is? Should we try to explain it? I don't know. I was, I, agree, I, I was going to say. I was going to say, as far as my extent for art is the I'm in the probably the 90s version where I am discovering everything in the programs I use and just going crazy with them. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, new tool. I'm going to try this and then use it to death. Yeah, I think that was kind of their mindset as well. <laughs> yeah, gradient, if anyone doesn't know, is just like a smooth transition from one color to the next. And, uh, or like it's a similar thing with like getting an airbrush, which does a, a similar thing. And people would do that a lot in the 90s because, again, to get like very like painterly type of rendering would have taken a lot of time. And, uh, because I'm computer processing power at that time, computer space to like even save all that information. Um, so a lot of times they would get like a lasso tool, which is you can like select an area and you kind of make a cut. It was like cut and grad was like a big thing. Um, and the cut was just, you make a selection. So it's basically like you mask something out and then you just airbrush or gradient in that area. And you have this very like smooth, everything looked like metal or plastic or something. It's like very shiny and bright. And some people were better at it than others, but a lot of people just like went crazy and everything was just bright and, and ridiculous. 
I definitely feel like we're in a golden age of colorists now, and and I'm beginning, just beginning, to see folks who are people who write about comics for comics publications, not people who write about comics for mainstream publications in the slightest, but people who write about comics for comics publications, beginning to acknowledge like the importance of the work that colorists do. Yeah, it definitely seems like there are more of those people nowadays. Well, I mean, just so on my end, I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I was going to say like my, my knowledge is rudimentary and like also with lettering is the same and inking is the same, but like mm-hmm. I can appreciate at least how much it sets the tone or the mood of what you're looking at. Like that's to me alone is well, is well worth mentioning and kind of diving into and, and examining because there's times where the, the colors for a comic just don't match, you know, the theme or the mood or the situation. And, you know, yeah. can kill it, but you know that like that's to me is like the minimal acknowledgement that should be done. And I'll, I'll admit, this is something I'm still learning about. It's not like I have a solid art background. Yeah, I mean, it feels sometimes like it's. As you can see, it feels sometimes like when it comes to things like both lettering and colorist, mm-hmm. you notice it most when it's bad. <laughs> And when it's really good, it just feels so seamless that you're not really aware of it. Yeah. I think that's the case for a lot of people. Um, so I hope that people are able to give it more attention and, like, not just be aware, like, oh, God, this is terrible. And see, actually, <laughs> this is contributing to how I'm, how I'm experiencing this piece of work. Um, yeah. Were there people who really inspired your approach as a colorist or like colorists when you're going back and looking at comics from our youth or that you feel like we're really worth a shout outs to? Oh yeah. I think the, I always had kind of an early interest in coloring without really thinking of it that way, I guess. Cause I just like to color my own work and, and do kind of like digital painting stuff. But um, as far as like when I first really noticed it in comics, I think was, when Dave Stewart was coloring that first run on Conan, um, like him and Carrie Nord, and he like treated it in a very painterly way. And oh, I think yeah. that was maybe one of the first times that I really like noticed and being like, this coloring is really like bringing a lot to this artwork, you know, and just like really mm-hmm. enhancing it in a, in a great way. And so he was like an early uh, person that I, I paid attention to. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people now <laughs> that, that I look, that I, that I enjoy. I don't necessarily like look to them specifically for inspiration, but you definitely probably like just by being exposed to it kind of pick up things. Hmm. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that like fans really have about what colors do? I think it's probably, they just don't understand it like period. Um, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, I've seen reviews of things where they'll praise something in the art that is, if, like, either totally or, like, heavily reliant on the cover, on the color, but they're praising the person who drew it, which is fine. Like, obviously, they, you know, they drew it. Um, but it's like they're not really, they don't seem to grasp what the colorist is doing at all um, and who is bringing what to the, to the work, you know. Uh, I don't, I can't think of like a specific thing because I don't I don't really mm-hmm. know what's in their head, but it just it just seems like a general kind of like ignorance. Right. No, that definitely I can definitely imagine that. Um, do you work? Can with you the think same of anchors a lot? Oh, go, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead with that question. I'll I'll ask after. Do you partner with the same anchors a lot? Um, well, let's say in almost all the cases of the artists I've worked with, it's, uh, it's the, it's the, it's like a pencil or ink or inker combo. Like there's not like a mm. discrete, uh, there's not like a, a separate person who's inking it in my experience working. I mean, there still are people that, you know, um, they have like someone pencils and someone inks it, but it seems like less common. And, and nowadays it's usually the same person drawing it and inking it. But yeah, there's definitely people that I continue to work with that I've worked with before. Um, There's just, we enjoy working with each other and we click very well. So I was going to ask for, and for those, I mean, I'm, and I 
put myself right into it. For those who are like trying to learn about coloring and and even inking or and all that, like, is there resources that you would suggest for people to check out? Hmm. I'm trying to think of as far as resources, I don't <laughs> know, <laughs> but um, I mean, you can find the odd podcast here and there. You know, what you hear uh, somebody on there. It's, it's just not as frequent. Um, but you'll know, you'll hear, you'll hear from Jordy and Matt at least, um, uh, mm-hmm. pretty often. Um, you can learn some stuff from Matt. Um, uh, maybe it's in like YouTube tutorials, but I don't know how much you get out of it if you're just like interested as a fan and not as someone who's also trying to, um, you know, get into coloring. Um, I think that's part of the problem, right? Is that there's not really a lot of material about that. So that people don't know anything about it. Well, for you, like, what's one of the things that reviewers or readers do you think that they miss a lot as far as, you know, what a colorist does or just get wrong discussing it? Um, it's, it's mostly just a lack of coverage, I think, that um, if there's a review and there's a colorist mentioned, oftentimes it's kind of like a throwaway, like, the colorist is good, <laughs> and then it's it, you know, like, um, the same thing with, like, a letter. It's kind of like, yeah, this person lettered it, and I, I could read it, and then they kind of, like, don't really build on that at all, because they don't have the language to talk about it, um, but as far as anything they specifically get wrong, uh, like I said, it just seems like they don't get that the colorist did this portion of it. It's, like, it could be, like, a very, like, a, like, a line artist that does, draws in a very open style or something, so then, and it's colored in a painterly way, say, kind of like the, like I said, with the Dave Stewart thing. Um, and there's something that is like kind of put in there, like a sky or or something, you know, that wasn't really there. It was just like open, and they let the colorist kind of work at it. And they'd be like, oh, there's like this beautiful sky that the artist and the list of line artist did. It's like they had nothing to do with that, you know. It's like right. Um, so it's just it's to me it's that kind of thing. I can't really think of another specific thing they get wrong. It's just they just don't seem to know, and then they don't speak about it. So. Yeah, I really want to think about, like, how to make sure that, as a critic, we're we're talking about, that we're talking about people's work in, like, terms that actually make sense for, like, what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely know that there's, there's comics where, you know, the colors are particularly striking in different ways, or it strikes me as, like, oh, that was definitely a creative choice and I like this creative choice or, wow, this particular color is super blinding to me and I love it. Um, But I think that, like, we don't always necessarily, and I'm speaking as, like, a critic who actually has a background in art, which, like, not that many do, um, don't necessarily know how to, not yet, not to separate out the the rules, but, like, the roles, rather, but... um, it, it doesn't, it, it's part of what you're looking at, you know, so it seems harder to just separate it from an assessment of the art as a whole. Um, I don't know, something I think we definitely need to do a better job of, because it's really important to recognize people for their work. It's incredibly important. Yeah. I mean, I understand that not everyone is coming from that background, and they're not going to understand it in that way, and that's fine you know if they if they don't understand it for me the the crux is more like at least at least credit it properly you know like at least include <laughs> it if you don't know how to talk about it, it's fine uh, i mean i i assume if you're a critic and you're trying to get better you probably want to like like develop those skills somewhat um if you don't okay but there the thing that like annoys me more like i said is just not acknowledging the contribution, I mean, like, literally not listing the colorist or mentioning them at all, or the same thing with a letter, um, that kind of thing. I'm surprised, actually, and I suppose impressed from the standpoint of being able to relinquish power and control to a specialist that, like, the um, the pencilers aren't, like, coming in being like, okay, guys, this is what it's going to look like. Um <laughs> And then just being like, you guys go implement. I'll be over here running and trying to make the next page. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm sure some people do act like that. But. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, there's definitely people that act like that, but those are the people you just don't want to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, those are the people you avoid. Yeah, it's once you find out, it's like, all right, I don't, I don't need this. I mean, and like, there's nothing wrong with giving direction. Um, like you were mentioning, like Nighthawk, and um, like I know Ramon before we were working on that, so we talk often still. And you know, he would send me things like pictures, just like like he'd send me pictures of shoes or like thing from a music video or something, and like kind of ideas for things. Now it wasn't like copy this, you know, but it was like here's what I'm thinking for this, and a lot of times that would give me like a starting point to work from. And, you know, then other scenes, he might not have a specific idea for that. So it's just like, whatever, just do what, do what you want there, and then we'll figure it out kind of thing. So there's nothing wrong with uh, them bringing ideas to it. It's just that, yeah, someone's, like, just dictating everything to you. And it's like, you don't need me. You just, just color yourself. Like, <laughs> you know what you want so much. Like, you don't need me, you know? Yeah, yeah. The partnerships definitely matter. Um, <laughs> I, you know, one of the things that I, I – um, I remember talking with you when we first I think, started following each other on Twitter was we wanted to, I was like, somebody needs to do a colorist appreciation month. And I had this idea of starting it and then I didn't have much of a follow up other than announcing that there should be a hashtag colorist appreciation month. <laughs> well, I think there is already the, the, uh, what's the day, but that's fine. Oh. Yeah. It's when, the, when are you going to get a month? Appreciation day. I think it's, like January 24th look it up. something like that um yeah I think Jordy started it like a, two or three years ago something like that oh I don't know if she intentionally started it but she kind of said that and then it kind of picked up steam so um yeah it's, it's been January 24th. January 24th. okay January 20th oh that does kind of maybe I was on Twitter the day that that came up and, I, and I'm forgetting it all now but um Oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, it's funny because actually, like, thinking about, like, you know, you, you work on, like, Doomsday, which is not Doomsday, Doom Patrol, <laughs> not at all the same. But <laughs> Doom Patrol, which is fabulous, um, really fabulous, and uh, definitely a comic that, you know, people are praising a lot for the, for the art. What was, what was your approach coming into that? Because, you know, it's Young Animal, which is sort of like a sub-imprint of DC. It's kind of a little bit like Vertigo. Yeah. Um, it's not the standard superhero book. Like, what was your creative process like for starting on that book? It was it was a little weird. I think they kind of, because of the way they talked to me about it, kind of like intimidated me a little bit. And plus, it being like, seeming like it was kind of a bigger thing. Um, and I think that everyone, I think, because uh, Shelley was still working on it a little bit behind the scenes at first. Um, when, when I came on, so it's like her, mm-hmm. Gerard, and Nick. So uh, I think they all saw my work. But they saw it from different things. <laughs> I think it was like someone saw Rat Queen, someone saw Wayward, and someone saw uh, Moon Girl. And you know, there's commonalities, but they're pretty different the way I handled the, those three different things. And so it was a little confusing, like things that I did, and I don't know which they want from that. And so I did, I don't normally do this, but I had sent like a bunch of examples. Like, here's a lot of different things I've done. Like, what are you feeling more for this? And uh, no one really gave me like a definitive. It's like, oh, just do, do what you want on do. And we'll, you know, which is always kind of scary <laughs> to hear from someone. Um, but yeah, I just kind of, we just kind of like, uh, I did some pages from there. Uh, uh, just kind of like, I think I probably leaned more, like a moon girl kind of thing that I'd been doing a little bit more towards that direction. Um, and, you know, there was some like back and forth, but, you know, it wasn't like major. It was just, you know, a few palette things or a hand, how to handle certain things. And just over like the course of a few issues, it's gotten to be pretty smooth and we all kind of get each other now, I think. Hmm. Do uh, That's do, really cool. Uh, I, I really feel like this particular palette for, for Doom Patrol generally feels like is very it's very it's very bright and I love it and like the outdoor scenes particularly um like the sunlight I I definitely stands out to me as a comic that has like sensitive and evocative colors and 
is but but often I feel like it's easier to talk about that when comics are going in like either hyper color direction or being very moody and very limited palette. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's sometimes harder when I feel like you're you have a big palette in Doom Patrol, but I still really feel it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess any kind of like extreme is easier to like notice and talk about. I know when we had a we had um when we had our two hundredth episode uh, yes yesterday last week, um one of the assistant the assistant editor Desiree Rodriguez said that one of the things she was doing at Lion Forge is making sure that there was like color guides for consistency in people's um, skin tone for characters, uh, especially important with characters of color because we've all seen like the mysterious slowly whitening over time uh, but Roberto da Costa for example yeah. from New Mutants and you know like there's actual racial implications right like I and I have heard like you know that this I, I would have thought uh, but I learned from a number of artists of color like yeah this is actually not normal to have like a color guide of like what colors to keep the people and on, on, on Nighthawk you had you know two the two main characters are both African American and you always, you know, like made sure that everybody looked right. And I was sort of wondering, like, if in the legacy from that, I mean, you know, the comics that have come with both of those characters and then after the fact were both written, at least, by David F. Walker, who's the writer who, you know, did that series with you. But the artists have been, like, lots of different artists. Um, right. I don't know. I mean, what do you feel like as a colorist, the sort of folks' roles in interpreting and maintaining, like, race across across different titles? Yeah, it's um i think a color guide as far as like relative color just in general um because things can change right like depending on lighting and stuff like that and it can shift things around um so i think it's good to be like this is like under a neutral setting this is how they should look right um the way i work is uh, it's hard to explain because it starts to get technical like i use the same color from page to page. So I don't deviate from that. The lighting source will move things around, obviously, you know, like you mentioned, like kind of the layer where it was like very purple and blue. So obviously that was, you know, uh, not natural skin tones in that situation. Um, but I start with the same skin tones every time and the same costume and everything um, to begin with in the flats. Uh, and I just modify the flats from there, but everything should still stay like normal and like within range because they're all being affected in the same way, right? Like, so I'll like throw like a purple light over, but everything's being affected by purple light. So still relatively should be able to differentiate as the skin tone should appear the same as it did before. Um, I think it's good like to, to have it just to be like, this is the look and don't, you know, just make sure that you stay there no matter what your, uh, how the, like I said, how the lighting may, may change things, but still make sure that you know, this, it looks like the skin tone and any other character details are matching this kind of, uh, like a master kind of document. But there isn't really like traditionally like, like communication between, you Do know, it, when team switch, which happen all the time. No, right? like, if you're asking if I had anything for them, no, they would just be going off of what I had done previously. Uh, like with Marvel, they usually will, you know, get some reference and send it to someone if the character or like location or whatever has appeared before. So I, I haven't seen that. So I don't know like what the status is with that, but um, I assume they looked at reference and stuff. So hopefully there'd still be like adhering to that. It kind of yeah. playing off this question, does different, do uh, different publishers have different coloring styles? Uh, I mean, maybe there's more, there's some that are more associated with different uh, publishers, but I've never tried to like, um, you know, modify what I'm doing to suit a different publisher. You know? uh, I mean, I, I may color something differently, but it's more about what the art is than, you know, thinking about in, in terms of a publisher. Hmm. I remember seeing a specific graphic that was like, specifically like the color palette for DC back in the Bronze Age that I like mm -hmm. early Bronze Age. I just sort of dug up somewhere on the internet and I was so entranced by it. And then I, I was actually looking at it, talking with a tattoo artist because I was getting a comics tattoo. And he pointed out like, you know, the color in this, of course, is all relative and different because the paper that's printed on, right? Yeah. 
that they were scanning. Yep. And color is all so entirely relative. I, I can't imagine like being in a final production house and like what looks on your screen is not the same as what's going to be even at the printed page. Yeah. It's, you have different technical means of trying to achieve that, but it, you know, no matter what, there's going to be some amount of like shifting and stuff that's out of your control. So I just, for me, I usually just try not to worry about it. Like, you know, I do my best to get <laughs> it to look a certain way and, you know, I'll look at, um, I'll see how something printed, um, it's usually like close enough that no one's really going to notice any kind of issue. And as long as it's within like an acceptable range, it's like, okay, this is good. It's fine. You know? Do you have a particular um, issue that you've worked on that you feel like is really like the highlight of your work that you've done? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. And also, like, it feels weird because they work on different things. And I don't want to sell anyone out. But, okay. Um, no, okay. Just from the standpoint of the colors, not from the standpoint of yeah, anything else. Um, I'm just clamoring it for, so they can't be so they can't be bitchy yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think really, I think it'll be newer stuff as I go, you know, because it'll be like, mm -hmm. hopefully you're learning and, and growing too as you go. I think on Doom Patrol, a lot of times each like new issue I'll like do some cool new thing and it's like like you know that I'm pretty proud of and um maybe that's the one I noticed it the most on probably so that's issue six the last one we did I guess hmm. okay that's and that's yeah that's not surprising right um <laughs> and, but yeah and Zoom Doom Patrol has been such like a huge huge hit I definitely associate, like, when I think about, like, going back to, like, Nighthawk, like, I associate Nighthawk with, like, tons of black, and then that magenta that, like, you're just like, yep, we're doing this. <laughs> it felt very fashion influenced to me. I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, but it was. I think it sure. is. So it's probably coming more for Ramon, though, for me. Um, like I said, he would, uh, on that one, we would, like, collaborate a lot on the color, you know, to come up with things. So, like, that layer was like from a music video so it like had a very strong like blue versus a purplish light which that was based on and for like an open the opening scene like he literally sent me a pair of shoes like use the palette from that um, oh nice Sport sneaker <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah very important <laughs> yeah. so like obviously you know like there's a degree of interpretation there especially like you get a pair of shoes and try to make a color palette out of it you know it's like um but yeah, like we we both had the same sensibilities there. Like I personally, even if something is kind of like dark and gritty, like that book was, I don't think that means you have to go like muted and dull for everything, right? Like it's still to me, I enjoy like having. You might use color in a different way. Still, you can have like a really like accented, saturated, you know, color that stands out um, to set things off. Um, yeah, so I think we were kind of on the same page there, anyway. But yeah, he definitely like shared a lot of ideas with me. As a colorist, is there anything that you find to be more challenging uh, to color than, than other things? Um, if there are a lot of characters, <laughs> so like team books, um, the style of the art can sometimes be harder, like if it's more of like an open mind thing where you're expected to do more of the rendering and, and filling in details um just as far as like the more time consuming so like wayward open line thing like what's an example of that like i think i know but yeah like like wayward is closer it's not completely open lines but he has shading and stuff in there but it's it's a it's pretty open um and that's a thing that is very rendered you know a lot of texture it's like kind of painterly things going on there so it's like a lot more that's put in versus something that's like a more graphic style there'd be like you know more like solid ink lines and you know bold shapes and things like that where it's more almost flat or like simple rendering if there's rendering um that that can be that's a lot less time consuming with uh wayward i mean, I mean there's just been, there's been awesome news lately for it i mean it got picked up as a possible tv show there's a game coming out do you get involved with any of that as far as like maybe the art direction or even the, just the coloring or in, in which aspect? You mean for the other for, media things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, the board game, I did the, I, I colored the cover, so as far as that, I assume they're just basing it off of the, uh, 
stuff from the comic, but I haven't done any like anything other than the, the cover, none of the like ins and outs. Um, for the for the animation thing, I know they were doing some colored guide stuff for it. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't do it, but it was all based on stuff I had established. Um, there was some stuff before I came on the book that was that was established, but um, I didn't personally do those. But it's still based off of uh, color decisions I made. Cool. So, how does it feel like a colorist to kind of see, you know, your work outside of of comics? Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know. It's interesting. It's still new, I guess. Like this stuff hasn't actually come out, and you know, with like a with like an option for like a TV thing, you never know what's going to actually happen with that. Um, like it's definitely like interesting, cool news to be on. Like something that you were there for, not just something that you worked on. That you know, like a Marvel or DC thing. You know, that's already its own thing, and it's already out there. But like something that you, even though I didn't come on it from the very beginning, I've been there. You know. Uh, pretty close to the beginning on Wayward, and yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, I'm, I don't know, looking forward to seeing how it all develops. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, because you would think they would want to continue the the style and the look that was in the comics, you know, definitely for the board game since it's all art, um, yeah. and for, you know, whatever happens, if it's animation or television, you know, live action, or whatever, for the TV show, you would think they would want to kind of keep something consistent. So that's why I was wondering was like, basically, did you hand off a, like, here's the, you know, the style of guy that I went with of, of are the colors and like that. So it's kind of, it's really interesting. Yeah. Were there any like decisions that, Oh shoot. I think I had set. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> were there any decisions that you've made that like, you had that were like really particularly challenging in terms of like when the artistic when it came down to the artistic direction like I just remembered that Devil Dinosaur has always been read because Jack Kirby did it right but, um, but I was trying to think if like there was questions where you're like I could go in any number of the ways and like what made you particularly choose one over another um hmm Correct me if I'm not really answering your question. <laughs> I'm trying to find a way in. Uh, like, I'll use the Moon Girl as an example. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's kind of changed a little bit because, you know, we were, like, Natasha has, like, handled it differently and I've handled it differently, you know, and kind of, like, now, like, you get to a point where it's, like, we both kind of gel better and know what we're doing. Um, just, you know, that happens anytime you're going to work with someone for a while. Um, it's on that because it's been going for a while now there are definitely things where it's like it's weird because you made decisions and now you're kind of I guess I could change it it's just more of a (laughs) thing for me where I get very um like anal about like maintaining consistency that no one else would probably notice if I changed it but yeah I do sometimes feel kind of like locked into a like decisions I made like a long time ago that maybe I wouldn't necessarily do it that way now but Hmm. you know you want to maintain consistency it reminds me of an interview I heard with um, the second singer of ACDC, Bruce Johnston, said somebody asked if he ever regretted um, singing in the particular like stylized way he does, which is very much through concrete gravel and you know, yeah. rather than using proper technique. And the reason proper technique is proper technique is like you don't hurt yourself. But um, somebody asked him about, and he's a, you know, he's like really iconic singer, right? Somebody asked him if he ever had any regrets about starting to sing the way he did. And he says, like, every day, laddie, every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, so, yeah. <laughs> I haven't had anything that's like come to bite me like that badly, but there are things where it's like, yeah, I don't know if I would do that, but we've kind of like established a look on it. It's never anything like bad. It's just sometimes mm-hmm. you're like, if you had been coming at it fresh, you might've handled it differently, but it's like, well, we've got like a look for this book now and I should kind of stay within that to a certain degree, you know? Do you think, do you ever think about like fashion in terms of making these decisions? Cause I, I'm look, I look at so many artists right now and I should probably explain this and people are just selling lots and lots of, you know, whether it's enamel pins, which is like the cool thing now, or if it's uh, t-shirts, but like that are, you know, with a very design level eye towards them. Like, do you think about 
people wearing art of what it is that you've designed, which is, you know, probably mostly only relevant when you're doing coloring characters. Um, mm-hmm. Does that sort of aesthetic, like, decision about people wearing and consuming the art in that way, like, is that something that folks think about in the colorist scheme of things? Honestly, no. I've never, <laughs> I've never really thought about that. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody wearing anything that I've, I've colored. Um, oh my gosh, guys! You need to get some Doom Patrol merch right, <laughs> right now. I mean, there may I'm be. I just haven't seen it. Sometimes I see things that I didn't know existed that I worked on in some capacity, and I'm surprised that it exists. It feels almost like some of the, you know, like I guess, like really, like the most interesting stuff is not. It's kind of like artists doing their own stuff and not really like licensed from the, the, the yeah. comic producer. Sad to say, anyway, um, not that we don't want to, but sometimes it isn't even <laughs> made, but maybe that's the reason. Ooh, yeah. Sarah, yeah, Brett, you said you had a question, Brett? I saw. Yes, I, actually, I got an interesting one. Uh, so we kind of talked about the digital versus, you know, tr- the old school way of doing things. Uh, for you, you know, as a creator and a colorist, do you think about doing colors on digital versus paper? Because I would imagine, like, the displays and the retina display have to impact it somehow. Hmm. Are you just saying, um, like, how it's going to print? Yeah, like, how, how it's going to look. I mean, I've noticed every so often, you know, looking at comic digitally, the colors look, you know, slightly different than they would print it out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, there's a little variation here and there. Um, has that, like, impacted at all w- with what you've done or what you do? Yeah, I guess it's the only thing I can really do is kind of compare it to what I have on the screen to the final like printed version when it comes out. Um, I mean, other people go through, like I said, they'll go through much more elaborate means. There's like these monitor calibration things and, you know, like different companies send you their specific color profiles for their printers, which I use, but it's still like so much variation. It's going to change. It's going to like, it's not going to look as vibrant because it's not, you know, it's not a screen. It's like, you know, it's not light. It's now on a piece of paper. Um, and maybe that piece of paper absorbs it in a different way and the color shifts and things. So I, I, I just kind of go, I just kind of like intuit it as best I can. I, I'm not trying to get super technical because I just feel like you're going to end up being frustrated and it's going to change anyway. So mm-hmm. as long as it changes within, you know, acceptable range, then that's all I can really do. And, and as far as people seeing it digitally, there's nothing I can do because it, at least with the way it prints, like, you know, yeah, it's the same company's probably using the, pr- the same printer every time, but you're talking about digital. Everybody's got their monitor calibrated some different yeah. way. They've got a different monitor, different operate. Like I, there's no way to like make that consistent. It's going to look different for everybody to some degree. Yeah, I can understand that, like having to stop at some point and like step away and be like, this is ultimately going to, I mean, people with monitors could be, could be any one thing at all. Do you have like, yeah, I know that that's, I've seen people get super uptight about that when it comes to website development and design. So (laughs) with like actual fine art, or I guess in this case, it's like, yeah, a whole different level of having to divorce yourself from obsessing too too much in those ways yeah and i'm sure in most situations it's still like it's not that much of a difference like i said i just try not to be that particular about it i'll just like i I feel like it's just you're gonna just you know it's too much to think about you know you can't control every factor so like i make Mm -hmm. it try to make it as distinct as i can so that even if it shifts you know, the relationships are still there between value and different colors. Like, they'll all shift in the same direction, hopefully, you know. So um, it shouldn't be too bad. I guess it's sort of just to bring back to something we spoke about a bit earlier, but, like, do you think it would be good to have those sort of relative color charts for particularly for character skin tone, like, become more of a norm in the industry? They kind of do it sometimes. It, de- it depends, but I don't know how. I know that I personally just usually use them as a guide because it's like sometimes you'll get a um, 
they'll do like a character design and they'll put like flat color on it, you know, to like, this is the character, you know, this is their costume, this is their skin, this is their hair, it's everything. Um, but that's a flat color thing on a white background, you know, like, I mean, it's not, I have to think about using it in different contexts. So I might like, it still like gives you like a baseline for what the, the makes the thing look like, but you might just kind of like tweak it a little bit. Um, I think it's a good thing to have, to have consistency, but I still think that just like with an artist that may have like interpretation of color is kind of natural sensibilities may like require them to make some alterations. Obviously, I still think you should like, when it comes to skin tone, you should be like, when you see the final product, it should look like this person has the same skin tone consistently. They have the same color costume consistently. It's just that it's rendered in a different style, but it's still recognizable as the same person, you know? Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, just I, I, the, the, the Bobby DaCosta just is always the one that I keep. Yeah, like that's, that's, a, that's a pretty extreme uh, example. So I definitely think, you know, you have an image of, even if you're just using reference, like of a previous character's existence, you know, like make them look like it's the same person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, I can't, like, he's black. Yeah. In terms of his skin tone, it matters. And yeah, that's yeah. also how I know who he is. So, yeah. um, but but yeah. I guess when I'm when I'm saying it, the only thing I say is like when people you like a pull like a specific color value, I don't know how you can really do that except if you're like I said on mine, I do a flats version which is always the same color, and then I make modifications to that to like push it in like a like for different colored lighting or something. Um, cool. So like you know, so the final version is not going to be that color samples that you picked right because like if it's under a slightly blue lighting or whatever it's going to shift a little bit but it should still be like the same value level like for the same lightness or darkness um it should still look like it's that just you know affected by by the surroundings um but yeah to have it as like shoot for this in the final it like this is what the person looks like awesome well, thank you so much. If you have a specific, like, you know, tips for folks who are thinking about becoming colorists um, and, you know, going in that particular direction in their comics art, it'd be great to hear that. Um, I know there's some some people on YouTube. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy I know. He, oh, sorry, scratch something. <laughs> um, his name's K. Michael Russell. He does some, like, YouTube videos on coloring, which are pretty good, and he has, like, like a paid course if you want to get deeper into it and there's some other people out there i'd say like follow colorists you know if you have if you want to get like some advice or something you can try to, to talk with them and show them your work and ask them their advice and stuff um so yeah like just like tutorials and and talking to people on a personal level i think it's pretty good awesome and are there things that you specifically would tell people like you should be a colorist because we get to do this, that, or the other, like an inspirational. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I know that I, it feels like you're putting, like, the final polish on something, right? Like, you're getting to, like, do the finish, you know, minus lettering, but as far as the artwork. Um, if, if that kind of thing appeals to you, if you like working with color, then it may be a job for you. I don't know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, no problem. Thank you so, for having me. Absolutely. So let our listeners know where we can find you on the internet. Uh, really about the only social media thing I do um, is on Twitter. So I'm at T on Twitter. Everyone go follow her. I know that <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, well, thank you very much for coming on. Like I know I've already kind of thinking through how to, approach coloring in future review. So, I mean, you, you've given me lots to think of uh, just out of this discussion. So it, it's pretty awesome. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we're glad to be here. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good night. Hey, thank you. You too. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Now, Brett, Bye. do we know what our guest is for next week? I don't think we do. I don't think we do, but it's also a holiday, so we should probably figure yeah, out for Memorial we have Day. A show next well, week. Yes. <laughs> we will not tape on Memorial Day, but perhaps there might be something coming up very soon. Well, yeah, possibly. Thank you guys for listening, and I hope folks who 
uh, are listening to this will join us on Wednesday for pop, hashtag pop politics chat. Again, hashtag pop politics chat to talk about Steven Universe and activism. Yes. And where can folks find you online? All the time. I'm on Twitter. Good God. E-L-A-N-A <laughs> underscore Brooklyn. And especially on Wednesday when I'm going to be doing the tweet chat. Uh, <laughs> I'm also on Tumblr a bit, uh, Ilana Brooklyn. And, um, and then I'm graphic policy, of course. Yes. Uh, if, if you're into comics or you're listening to this, there's probably a good chance you are or art in general, you should go check us out every single day at graphicpolicy.com. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Tumblr, all at Graphic Policy, keeping it really consistent. Uh, as always, thanks for listening. Uh, if you came in late to this episode want to listen to it again, uh, you can catch it on Stitcher and iTunes. It'll probably be up in like an hour or two. Um, if that's not your, your thing for listening, it'll be up on Sound, SoundCloud tomorrow and posted on our site, so you'll be able to catch it there and share it with your friends. Um, as always, thank you so much for listening. If you if you do catch it on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever, please rate it and you know rate it whatever five stars, whatever the highest rating is. Uh, doing that it helps uh, support the podcast and get the word out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, as always, thank you. <laughs> Until next time, <laughs> appreciate it. I'm Brett. I'm Ilana. Keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.